Okay, well, we are going to be reading from Acts chapter 12 today. If you have a Bible, you want to open that up. But before we do get to Acts 12, I want to uh, re- introduce you to, or probably reintroduce you to, is a little bit better, a couple of the people that we are going to be reading about today so that you, can, you remember who they are, what's going on here. Um, when you hear their story in the book of Acts, you're like, oh yeah, now I know who that is because these names will sound familiar, but I want to make sure you remember. Uh, the first one is pretty well known, and his name is James um, in the Bible, there are several different Jameses. Um, there is James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James. Uh, so that's one James. That's not the one we're talking about today. There's another James um, who is the son of a guy named Zebedee, James, son of Zebedee. And he's got a brother whose name is John. Good. James and John. James and John, uh, sons of Zebedee. And you probably know them, or at least remember some of these stories I'm going to tell you. They are, they have quite a they have a really cool, repu- in my opinion, a really cool reputation in the Bible. They're part of Jesus' inner circle. Um, so it's always kind of Peter, James, and John, uh, these three like people who are closest to Jesus. Um, they are full of shenanigans, uh, the, two, the two of them, James and John. Jesus, at one point, he calls them sons of thunder because they are just constantly kind of getting themselves into trouble, putting a lot of, uh, putting their feet into their mouths. They're the um, third and fourth apostles or disciples that Jesus calls. Remember, they're sitting in their boat with their dad, Zebedee, and uh, Jesus says, come and follow me. And they, they drop their nets right there and they go and they follow Jesus. I always picture poor Zebedee at that point, like going, okay, thanks, Jesus. You know, I don't know, kind of like bummed out uh, to see him go. But these are the two, James and John are the two that remember that scene where that Samaritan village kind of rejects Jesus and, and they're like, hey, Jesus, come on, let's call down some thunder or some lightning and burn that place up or whatever. And Jesus is like, you guys, we can't do that. Don't do that. This is kind of like James and John have these big personalities. Um, like there, it seems like Jesus is always kind of holding them back from all these different things. Matter of fact, somebody took a cell phone picture of Jesus literally holding them back. Here it is right here. Uh, the, there it is. Yeah. Okay. That's, um, uh, that's from the, the chosen. Anyway, just in case you're wondering who they were in the chosen, which doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about anyway. Um, but there's, so, so they're, they're kind of impulsive, kind of self-serving a little bit, but Jesus just loves them. He, he they're like, uh, you know, I think they'd probably be in his best friend circle. I want to read you just one story from Mark chapter 10. You don't have to turn there, um, but I'll read you this. It's kind of an important moment for our reading in Acts 12 today. Mark 10, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. It's a great way to lead into something, like just going to your wife or your husband, not like, okay, don't say anything. I just want you to do whatever I ask of you and see what happens. Um, you're a genie, right? Am I rubbing the lamp in the right place? Anyway, okay. Um, and Jesus actually, he kind of humors them. He's very gracious. He says to him, verse 36, he says, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. And Jesus responds to them. He says, you do not know what you are asking. You don't know what you are asking. Um, Are you able, he says, to drink the cup that I drink and to be baptized with the baptism that I am being baptized? And they said to him, we are able. Right? Doesn't really give them what they ask for. A bit later, he'll say, Sitting at my left and sitting at my right is not mine to give, but are you willing to drink the cup? And if you know the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, you know that that is a pretty ominous statement for Jesus to make to James and to John. So let's go ahead and open to Acts chapter 12 verses, uh, just the first five verses we'll read right now. We're switching gears a little bit. Last week, we were in Antioch, if you remember, the church in Antioch, and the conversion of more Gentiles, and um, Barnabas is sent there, and Barnabas goes and gets Paul, who's over in Tarsus, brings him over to the church in Antioch. So we're leaving Antioch. We're actually going back to Jerusalem, and we're going to be in Jerusalem when this scene picks up in Acts chapter 12. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, if you've been with us at Crossroads, you know why that it might have pleased the Jews. 
When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. If you are writing in your Bible, underline or highlight that last sentence. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made by God or to God by the church. Um, We're going to come back to that. So let me go back though to James and John, because uh, this is kind of the moment that, you know, you don't really see this stuff all connected together, but you go back in the gospels and you see those, just like the good old days, right? When G. Peter and James and John and, and, the, and the disciples are all running around the country and they're, they're Peter or Jesus is healing people and doing all kinds of miracles. And, and James and John are so like, so they feel so strong about who Jesus is, so strong in their faith, who Jesus is that they go to him. They got this harebrained idea. They're like, listen, when we get to the other side, let's, let's, when we're sitting in glory, I want to sit at your right hand and he wants to sit at your left hand. Can we do that? Because they're so convinced of who Jesus is. And Jesus tells them, he says, you have no idea what you're asking. You don't know what you're even asking. Are you really, really willing to take this cup? This is the same cup that when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane, that he prays for God to take him, take from him that he wouldn't have to drink of that cup. This is a cup of of suffering. This is the cup of death. And he says to James and John, he says, listen, I am gonna drink of this cup. You don't know what this means, but are you really willing to go all that way? Are you really willing to follow me all that way? And if you're willing, if you're willing, it is going to cost you something. They don't know right now that, you know, in the Gospels, they don't know exactly what that means. Although Jesus is, you go back and look at it in hindsight, and you're like, oh, he's actually pretty clear about a lot of this stuff. He he comes out and says a lot of things to him really plainly. Um, But this time, uh, he's saying, you're going to, if you you walk that close to me, some of the blows that were meant for me are going to land on you. Like, if you're that close to me, if you you follow me that closely, some of the things that happen to me are going to happen to you. He says, are you... Are you, um, are you ready for that? Are you, are you ready for that? Man, I, I know I've talked about this before in the church, but you cannot read the Bible honestly and not see the prominence and the importance of suffering in the life of the believer. You just, if you're just reading it honestly, you cannot help but see that. Specifically, suffering all throughout the Bible that is brought about because of persecution. Because we are following that close to Jesus, you, you see this over and over in the New Testament. Now, this isn't the same as suffering that we just bring on because we made dumb decisions. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm so- talking about suffering that comes from following Jesus so closely that some of the things that happen to him are going to happen to you. It's what happens when we follow Jesus that closely. Oswald Chambers, in, um, in My Utmost First Highest, he says, no healthy Christian ever chooses suffering right? Okay, that's good. Like, you'd be weird if you're like, oh, I just want like self-mortification or something was popular for some time, I guess. They're like, well, I just want to make myself suffer. That's not, no healthy person does that. But he chooses God's will just as Jesus did. And that can result in suffering. Number one in your outline, persecution is at the heart of the Christian story. And I just feel like, you know, as we're going through the book of Acts, I told you we're, we're going through this book so that we can see how the early church dealt with some of these things that we don't really want to deal with, that we don't really want to think about. We don't really, we'd rather just skip over. But the truth is that as you go through this story of the early church, you're going to see over and over that persecution is part of the, of the story. It's at the heart of our story. It just is. I don't know how the church has missed teaching this over and over. I think what we want to do is we want to tone all this stuff down because we want just, we want to just win people the faith. So we, we will say, we'd say things, but it, it kind of feels like a, like to me, just a little bit of a bait and switch. Like we say, hey, just come on in because we want you to be in heaven. And Jesus is like, come on in. I, we want you to die. You're like, well, okay, wait a second. Nobody ever told me that. Nobody ever said when I signed up for this thing, follow me and you're going to be persecuted just like I am. Nobody ever says that to us. And now persecution comes and we start freaking out about it. We're like, whoa, where did this come from? Like, how, why is this happening? I'm like, well, maybe we're not really actually 
reading our Bibles and actually reading what the Word of God tells us, we got to start thinking about this stuff and thinking in our hearts and minds. Uh, someone here, I forget who it was, and I apologize. If you're the one, come tell me about it because I forget who you were, but you recommended a book called The Insanity of God to me. Um, and uh, at first, you know, I get a lot of book recommendations. I'm like, oh, I don't know. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that uh, one day down the list. And I, I had it in my, um, in my stack for a while. I finally picked it up. And as soon as I picked it up, I couldn't put it down. It's not, a, it's not an easy book um, to read. The Insanity of God, A True Story of Faith Resurrected by this guy named Nick Ripkin. And uh, he, is, um, he was working for uh, an NGO in the early 1990s in Somalia. Uh, if you remember back, just the Somali, you know, um, famine that went through and the, just the persecution that they suffered. And um, he's there. Remember, uh, remember Black Hawk Down and Mogadishu and that whole, these battling warlords and tribal things going on and, and the people who were just living their lives were just being decimated. And so he's in that country during that time. And so he writes this book. It's partly about that. Let me just read you one little section of it here. He says, uh, those of us who have grown comfortable with the teachings of Christ have allowed his teachings to lose their edge. So much of what Jesus taught makes no sense from a human perspective. Love your enemies. If you want to be great, first learn to be a servant. If someone smacks you across the face, turn your head and let them slap you on the other side. If someone steals your coat, offer him your shirt as well. If you want to live, you need first to die to yourself. The complete list of Jesus' crazy-sounding teachings is a lot longer than that. But to me, the most startling thing Jesus ever said when he assigned his followers the task of going out in pairs to share his good news with lost people, he said that he was sending them as sheep among wolves. Still, he expected them to prevail. In the history of the world, no sheep has ever won a fight with a wolf. The very idea is insane. Um, James, he leaves his net, leaves his dad, leaves the boat. And Jesus says, follow me. And James literally sets out and becomes a sheep among wolves. He is not going to survive this. He is following Jesus that closely that he is literally not going to survive. In fact, every one of the apostles, except for the apostle John, dies a martyr's death like a sheep. Jesus says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you, are you willing to drink the same cup that I drink? Are you ready for that? What if that is the life that God has called you to? Are you, are you ready? Like, we don't, I don't want to talk about this sort of thing. You know, like we, no wonder people skip over this sort of stuff and just got to kind of pretend it doesn't really exist and we just move through things. But James is going to get killed for this. Peter is going to get thrown back in prison again. Like, I think this is number three or number four time. Eventually, he is going to die. Uh, there's a guy named Charles Martin who wrote a book called They Turned the World Upside Down. He says, these disciples turned the world upside down because they saw a dead man come back to life by the power of God. And whatever that knowing and seeing did in them, it did it at such a deep level because they spent their lives talking about him and doing what, they, what he did. And they weren't just fair weather friends. They stuck it out even when it got tough. And then he goes and he lists all the deaths of all the 12 different or 11 different apostles. He says, what would do this in these men? They believed something so deeply that they did not turn tail and run when the executioner appeared with blood dripping off of his axe. What would you do? Um, I, so I feel like maybe nobody told us <laughs> that persecution is actually at the heart of our story. And we've been, you know, we know we've been blessed to live in peace. We've been blessed to live in comfort, but do not let the peace and the comfort lull you to sleep. Do not let it rock you to sleep. There's another story. I'm going to read three little stories from the insanity of God. 
And this story, he goes to, um, he ends up going to Ukraine and talking to people who were persecuted under the Russians in communist Russia and trying to live out their faith. And he meets this guy named Stoyan. And Stoyan, um, he talks about being in prison. I think he was in prison three times. And he talks about it. And he's leaving Nick Ripkin, the author of the book. And he's just about to go. And I just want to read you what he wrote. It says, um, he leaned forward and he poked me in the chest with his finger as he continued. He said, don't you steal my joy. I took great joy that I was suffering in my country so that you could be free to witness in your country. And then he raised his voice in a prophet-like challenge that I knew would live with me forever. Don't ever give up in freedom what we have never given up in persecution. That is our witness to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't ever give up in freedom what we would never have given up in persecution. Sometimes, man, I'm telling you, sometimes the freedom and the comfort and the security and all the blessings that God has bestowed on this, it actually lulls us into a sense of complacency. Like we don't have to fight for things that we should be fighting for. We don't have to, we don't have to be strong for things. It's like, oh, that's fine. It's just, it's just the way things always are. Uh, but persecution is at the heart of the Christian story, but we are remarkably free from it. And I just want, I just think we need to ask the question that is the church actually stronger because we're living in a place with no persecution. Where nobody's coming up against us like Herod was coming up against the apostles. Nobody's coming up against us. Are we, are we stronger? Because we have had the freedom to be able to live out faith any way we wanted. We can walk up to anybody on the street and talk to them about Jesus. And we're not putting our lives on the line. Is our faith stronger because of that? I don't know, man. I think we need to at least ask the question about what God does through persecution. We need to ask what, he, what he's doing in the church and how he uses that to strengthen the church. Or have we just fallen asleep? Jesus says to the church in Revelation 2, or in Revelation 3, what does he say to Sardis? He says, wake up and strengthen what is about to die. Strengthen what is about to die. Wake up. Because this, all, this whole thing just kind of like, ah, uh, it's no big deal. It's like we just kind of roll with it and, and we, we, we give up in our freedom the things, that in their pers- the things that in people's persecution, they would never have given up, right? But I, I don't want this to be a, just a one-sided message because what about deliverance, you know? I mean, what about we're praying for deliverance all the time? We're like, God, please don't let that suffering come to us. Please don't let this, this person come against me like that. I pray against them in the name of Jesus, right? We're, we're like constantly trying to push back on that thing because we don't want that to be a part of our lives. So I want to continue with the story, and I want to see if we can kind of put a, put a little bit more nuanced understanding of this. On the next part of our story, uh, this is what gets to kind of inspires the imagination with us. It en- emboldens and encourages our faith. Uh, we're going to jump back into verse 6. And we're going to see a little bit different thing happen here. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, that's so we're talking about Peter. So remember, Peter is arrested, kept in prison, put in, under guard. Um, but earnest prayer was made for him by God to, to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to them, next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. I kind of picture him like kicking him in a second. Like, get up, Peter. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said, dress yourself and put on sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord. And they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting, right? And they, I don't know, I th- we're, all, we're all waiting for that kind of de- deliverance. I, I hope you are. I hope you're, you're praying and you're expecting that God would like 
give you that kind of like break the shackles off your hands, whatever is holding you captive, just open the doors, take you by the hand, guide you right out in front of the guards, throw open the gates in front of you and and just bring about an answer to all the prayers. He was going to provide a home. He was going to cleanse you of the disease. He's going to answer all the prayers. He's going to fill the account. Whatever it is you pray for, I hope you're praying in expectation that God would move like that. All right? I, I really do. And when he does, Because he does sometimes, he comes in and he moves like that. And when he does that, man, you be like that one out of 10 lepers that thanks him, that praises him, says, thank you, God, for the deliverance that you brought in my life. Man, make sure you don't forget that because God doesn't do that for everybody. He doesn't do that for everybody. So when he does it for you, you better offer up your praise. You better offer up your thanksgiving to God. But if you're one of the people who doesn't have the prayer answered in that way, you find yourself like... um like I think of John the Baptist, hands still in chains, saying, Jesus, Jesus, are you going to come? Right. And Jesus says, no. And John goes to his death, right? Or um, you think about the people who were beaten so far in the book of Acts, they, they get beaten for being believers in Jesus Christ. Sometimes you're going to pray to God and you're going to find yourself like James at the business end of a sword. And even though you've been praying, a God, God's answer is no. At that moment, at that moment, what you do is you do exactly what Peter did the last time he was in prison. He started singing praise and doing exactly what you do when you get your prayers answered. He started praising and he started thanking God. You do what the early church did in Acts chapter 5 when they had been beaten, literally beaten, and they rejoiced and they counted it worthy to have suffered dishonor for the name of Jesus Christ. I, I told you. We're going to do this thing differently. We are not going to be doing this thing the same as the rest of the world. We are going to do this different. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If someone smacks you in the face, turn your head and let them slap the other side. If someone steals your coat, offer your shirt as well. If you want to live, you need to die first. And that's just not even the beginning of Jesus' crazy sounding teaching. His list is a lot longer than that. So I want to remind you, I've said it a couple of times before. Number two, remember, we are called to distinction. We are doing this thing different. We are doing this different. Paul writes in Philippians, he says that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We are different. Amen? Amen. That's a tough amen. That's an amen with some sacrifice to it. That's an amen that requires something of us, of every single one of us. And I pray to God, and we never have to find ourselves in this situation. I pray that God would always come in to every one of ourselves and just throw the chains off. And we would, we would make, walk, just walk out going, thank you, Lord. That was awesome. But I just got to say, we got to be prepared for the other two. We got to be prepared for the other two. I'll talk to you about a verse in Peter in just a minute. Let me read one more section, and then I'm going to give you your homework uh, for tonight. You're going to have homework, and this is going to be a cool challenge. I hope uh, we'll see if you guys take me up on it. We'll see. Verse 12. So Peter kind of comes to, he says, oh, an angel must have rescued me. Verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Rhoda's going to live in infamy here for a minute. Um, Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so, and they kept saying, it's his angel. But Peter continued knocking, because Rhoda forgot to let him in, of course, Um, continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to him with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers, to the other James. 
And then he departed and went to another place. Now when the day came, there was no little disturbance over the soldier, well, among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. Because they wake up and he's just gone. After, after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Okay, so I just love this little section, just a, just a real little section of Scripture, just down-to-earth section of Scripture. So Rhoda kind of has this funny moment where she, you know, opens the door. She's like, Peter, and she takes off, and Peter's like, hello, open the door. I can't get in. Um, runs in to tell everyone, and then just how human is this thing? Listen to what happens next. She goes in. Listen, this is the very thing that they have been praying for, right? <laughs> They've been praying for Peter's release. And though Peter's standing at the gate, they're like, hey, Peter's here. They're like, you are crazy. You are crazy. I mean, come on. We don't believe you. You can't, you know, like uh, uh, the thing, the very answer to their prayer like, don't we pray like this sometimes? Like, the very answer to their prayer is so unbelievable to them that they're willing to, like, girl, you are out of your mind. The Bible says that they are may, they're just amazed. Because isn't that how we usually pray? Okay, could we just be honest with each other for a second? That we pray often, and sometimes we're just full of expectation that God is just going to answer that prayer. But sometimes we're like this group of people, and we're like, what? You answered that prayer? You know, like, really? Like, wow, you, like we, don't, we don't always expect that God is going to answer the prayer. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just be honest with you for just a second here, because I know why. Because I, I feel this in my own like, heart. I feel this in my own life when I pray. I know why I don't always expect that God is going to answer the prayer. It's because sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> Can we just be honest? And I, I don't know, hopefully not speaking sacrilege here. Let me just get to the point of what I'm trying to say. And I know God, I know the Christian answer we give each other. God always answers your prayers. He either gives you a yes, a no, or not right now. And that's fair. I get that. Um, but you think about the people who maybe prayed over James the same way that they prayed over Peter. I think about his brother John. I don't know if he witnessed his brother getting taken off uh, into Herod's hands. I don't know if he was there to witness his brother's death, but I wonder how many of those people prayed like they just prayed for Peter. And God Maybe he just answered the prayer. Maybe he actually told them, no, I'm not going to answer that prayer. Or maybe they just saw their prayer being unanswered. And I, I just pictured J John, like, Brother John, you know, favorite son of thunder, fellow son of thunder, like, oh, that was my brother, God. Like, you know those prayers that we, we put up to God and they don't get answered? If any of them prayed that James was going to emerge unharmed at that moment, uh, those prayers were not answers. He, 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 Herod killed James with the sword. Our, our prayers don't always put this like magic bubble around our lives. They don't always put this, we pray for a hedge of protection, you know, like whatever other if you're forced line of defense that you want to pray for. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But let me tell you why I think that is. And this is what I want you to uh, take away. I'm going to have you write it down. Number three, because obedience to God is not always safe, okay? Obedience to God is not always safe. And I know, I know we don't always say that in church. I, well, we'll read one more last little section from, from the book, and now I'll see if I can drive this home, and then um, we'll get out of here. Um, Nick Ripkin, he says, um, I'm not sure if I ever heard it said out loud, but I picked up on the idea that obedience to God's call would result in a life of safety and security. The safest place to be, I was told more than once, is right in the center of God's will. And that sounded both true and reassuring. I admit, however, my surprise when many years later I found myself living a life that was neither safe nor secure. I was stunned when, despite what I considered to be a life of sacrificial obedience, I could point to very little in my ministry that was effective. There were simply no results to measure. And success was a word that I would never have used to describe what I had done. It might, in fact, be safe to be in the center of God's will. But we would be wise to stop and think about what it means to be safe. 
Like Job in the Old Testament, I knew that my Redeemer lived, but I couldn't figure out why he was being so painfully silent. I was desperate for answers, but my question simply hung in the air. Does God, in fact, promise his children safety? Do things always work out for those who are obedient? Does God really ask us to sacrifice and to sacrifice everything? Isn't it possible to love God and to pretty much keep living the life I already have? I want to add a couple of questions for us to, um, to leave here with. These are questions. You can't answer these questions. I can't answer these questions. These are hypothetical questions. Um, I pray to God we never have to answer any of these questions, but I do think that there's something important about letting them sink into our soul and, and start to formulate the answer to these questions. I gave them to you in your Digging Deeper section, but um, here's just a couple of things. One, will your faith survive not only a no answer to prayer, but no answer? Are you ready to let go of your own comfort, your own security? Here's a digger. And that of your family so that you might be obedient to Christ. Which is a higher priority, your life or Jesus? Like I said, I pray that we'd never (laughs) have to answer those questions in this life. But I also pray that if the time ever comes, that we would be ready with an answer. Because I don't want to trade the safety of existence for a life of faith, for a life of real faith. And I hope that God doesn't have to use persecution in my life and in your life to drive us deep into him and to wake the church up. I don't ever want to see, you're praying against it as much as I am. We're praying against it, but the truth is that God sometimes uses that stuff to wake the church up to wake the church up so that the things that we are living in freedom, that we would not give those things up so that when we get into persecution, we know what we have to fight for, we know what we're going to stand strong on, and now we do not get lulled into a sense of complacency and just sleep when God is calling us to depth and to deepness of faith. This is what he is after in every single one of us. So, let me say this before I close in prayer. You have homework. I'm going to ask you to do this. You notice, at the end of Acts 12, there's like five or six verses that I didn't read. Okay, this is a big challenge for you. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, It's on the back of your sermon notes. I want you to take those sermon notes home. I want you to read those five or six verses. And um, I want you to email me the answer to my question. I, there are a thousand people who come to Crossroads on Sunday morning. Um, I want, I'm shooting for 500 emails in my inbox this week. That is my goal. That five, half of you actually took me up and read five verses of Scripture and emailed me the answer to the question. I gave you my email address, paul at crossroadsbigfork.com. I would love, I won't be able to respond to all of them. I'll tell you that right now. But I promise you what I will do is I will read every single one of them because what happens in the last five verses is actually really important for this story of persecution. And it's important for us to realize and to understand in context of who God is. Leave it at that. Let you think through it, pray through it, answer the question. Could you do me a favor? Email me. That'd be really cool.